splash by welding sends sparks flying. Thermit, it burns hotter than lava. But which makes the strongest railway weld? And why hasn't one fully replaced the other? As a track engineer, I've seen rails welded together countless times, from small maintenance jobs up to major renewals. I've seen the flash butt welded, long rails dropped at re-rail sites, and thermit welds warm up cold winter nights. By the end of this video, we will have explored how both weld types work and why one hasn't made the other completely obsolete. We'll start with how each weld works, then compare them on quality, speed, cost, and logistics before wrapping up with where each one fits best on the railway. Let's start with the newer kid on the block, flash butt welding. Flash butt welding is an electrical resistance welding process. The rail ends to be joined are set apart at a set distance with an electrical current applied. The gap between the rail ends creates resistance and produces an arc. That arc, that's what gives you all those dramatic sparks. This arc is what melts the metal. When the correct temperature is reached, the rail ends are pressed together, forming the joint. Thermit, or aluminothermic welding to give it its proper name, takes a different approach. It uses a filler material to join the rail ends. This material is molten metal created through the thermite reaction that is then poured into a mould around the rail ends which have been preheated to a suitable temperature. This molten metal fuses the rail ends together. After an amount of cooling time, the mould can be removed and the weld is cleaned up with hydraulic snips and ground to profile. But which process produces the better weld? And why does it matter? The proof, as always, is in the pudding, because it's not the process that matters the most, but the final result. The quality and overall strength of the weld is key to ensuring it can withstand the forces of being in the track and is safe for trains to run on. Both flash butt welding and thermit welding have been proven plenty strong enough to be used in track, otherwise they wouldn't have made it this far. Flash butt welding creates a forged bond between the rail ends. It's a highly mechanised, tightly controlled process that produces a uniform grain structure at the microscopic level. That uniformity improves strength and fatigue resistance, and because the weld is formed under pressure, most impurities are expelled. Thermit welding is much more hands-on. The results depend heavily on the welder's skills and has more steps. Rail alignment, mould sealing, preheat and final grind all need to be spot on. It's easier for defects to occur, like porosity, tiny gas bubbles or inclusions, foreign material trapped inside the weld. So I think you'll agree that while thermite welds do achieve the required quality and strength needed for welds, flash butts win this round. But quality is just one part of the equation. On the railway, time is always ticking and productivity can make or break a job. Time is always of the essence on the railway, whether it's undertaking maintenance or renewals, one eye is always on the clock, which relentlessly ticks down to the time the track has to be handed back and trains start running again. This then leads to a focus on productivity, achieving the most in the time available, and welding is no different. In fact, given its role in joining the rails, it is often the crucial task that determines if a job can be completed or not. If you don't have enough time to weld the rails back up, is it the right thing to do to cut them in the first place? Welding has four phases. Setup, the welding itself, cooling, and finishing. For both types, it starts with rail alignment, but the methods differ. Flash butt machines do this mechanically, using computer control. Thermit welders do it manually, using wedges, hammers, and straight edges. This is one of the areas where welders' skill and experience definitely shines through, but it can still take time to get that set up right. Once aligned, thermit welders set up the mold. Positioning and sealing it properly is crucial, not just for the weld shape, but to prevent molten steel from leaking out. It's delicate and it takes time. The welding itself, flash butt takes the lead again, it's one continuous process, heating, then pressing together. Thermit requires the ends to be preheated first. Then the thermite reaction ignites and pours molten steel into the mold. Then comes cooling. Flash butt welds can be trimmed and released within eight minutes. Thermit welds, you'll have to wait 10 minutes before trimming and up to 30 minutes before grinding can even start. Good finishing of the weld matters. A smooth, flat weld surface ensures wheel stability and reduces wear. Flash butt welds produce minimal excess material, which the machine can trim instantly. Grinding of thermit welds takes time, and is another area where the welder has to pay close attention to ensure a good finish is obtained. One other bonus, flash butt machines can also stress the rail as part of the weld. With thermit, it takes a separate step, and extra equipment. In terms of pure cycle time and output, this round again has to go to the flash butt welder. Is the thermit going to actually get the edge in one of these rounds? I do have a good feeling about the next one. Equipment needs to be purchased, people have to be trained to use it, 
and possibly most importantly, it has to then get to the site where it is needed. When you look at the two different welding setups, they're very different. Thermit setups involve a lot of small parts and tools, gas bottles, moulds, grinders and more. Flashback welding? Just one massive purpose-built machine. Well, and the vehicle it's mounted to. So when it comes to cost, it's the cost to buy it and then the cost to run it. I don't have exact figures, but it's fair to say that one flashback machine likely costs more than an entire Thermit welding kit, a lot more. But Thermit does rack up the costs over time with consumables like moulds, portions, gas and grinding discs. Napoleon said, amateurs like strategy, professionals talk logistics. That's especially true in rail work. Getting gear and people to the right place at the right time is half the battle. Due to their size and machine mounted nature, flashback welding units typically require full possessions and electrical isolations, at least under UK rules. These are costly and time consuming to arrange. And on top of that, they need access points to on-track, which in dense urban areas can be few and far between. In contrast, thermite teams can carry all their gear through a standard access gate and use a trolley to reach the worksite. They need a lower level of access, quicker and cheaper to organise, and far more flexible in tight or remote locations. But it's important to point out the manual nature involved, both getting to the site and the welding itself. Thermit crews often haul heavy gear through narrow access gates, sometimes up flights of stairs, that introduces a real risk of both short-term and long-term injury. So we've put flashbutt and thermit welding head to head. And on paper, in this case, again, flashbutt comes out ahead. But if that's the case, why hasn't it made thermit welding obsolete? As we've seen, flashbutt welding is the more advanced technology, but it comes with limitations. So in the end, it's the situation, where you are and what you're trying to do, which decide which weld type wins the day in this round. So we'll call it a draw. If you're finding this video interesting and want to learn even more about the railway and the engineering behind it, I've got two free resources for you. First, I have a six day email course that breaks down the fundamentals of horizontal track geometry, perfect for building a solid foundation of knowledge. Second, just for signing up to my email list, I'll send you my free guide to CAN ebook. CAN is one of the most crucial concepts in railway engineering, and this guide will give you everything you need to know to understand it clearly. Both are completely free. Just check the link in the top right hand corner or in the description below to grab them now. Not all railway welding happens out on track. A significant amount takes place in workshops that build switches and crossings and in the rail yards where long welded rails are prepared and delivered to re-railing sites. In these controlled environments, flashback welding wins hands down. It's faster, more cost effective and delivers higher quality. A big part of this is because the machines either stay in one place or only move short distances within the yard as well as their fast setup and cycle times. Likewise, if a track worksite has the right protection in place, and if there's access for the flashback welding equipment, then its speed, reliability and safety profile make it ideal. This is perfect for major renewals, as long as it doesn't cause too much machine congestion on site. That said, here in the UK we haven't seen widespread use of flashback welding on renewal sites or at all. Why do you think that is? Let me know in the comments. At this point, Thermit welding might seem like it's losing every round, but hang on a second. Big weekend possessions are rare, especially in the UK. Most track maintenance happens in short blocks, both in time and physical space. These jobs don't allow for isolation or machine on tracking. Thermit welding teams can handle both these short blocks and they're equally capable in large scale projects when needed. So it really comes down to this. One weld type looks inferior and old school on paper, but works in almost every situation. The other delivers top tier results, but only when the conditions allow it. Which one do you think wins? Let me know in the comments. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button.